So welcome everyone to today's seminar. I'm Beth Mischewski, host and co-organizer of the sustainability seminars at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. Our next seminar will be on October 5th and will be uh, Plastic Producers Solutions on Marine Litter, presented by Stuart Harris of the American Chemical Council. I'd like to remind everyone here to please turn off or silence electronic devices as we are recording this seminar. We'll be holding all questions until the end. For our online audience, uh, you can type in your questions at any time in the questions box, and those will be addressed at the end as well. This seminar will be archived on our website in about a week or so. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Julie Ryder. Julie is Vice President of Human Resources and Sustainable Development for Clark. Clark is a global environmental products and services company that focuses on mosquito control and aquatic services and is based in St. Charles, Illinois. Julie has more than 30 years of experience in human resources field and has been with Clark for 17 years. In 2012, Julie's role expanded at Clark to include sustainable development and her presentation will discuss Clark's sustainability success stories. I'd also like to note that those sustainability successes have resulted in Clark being a three-time recipient of the Illinois Sustainability Award, which is organized by ISTC. This year's award ceremony will be on October 24th in Chicago, Illinois. For more information on the award ceremony, um, you can visit our website, istc.illinois.edu. Uh, now please join me in welcoming Julie. Wow, thank you. Um, glad to be here, honored by the invitation. Thank you very much. So first, before, before I get uh, begin, a couple of things. Uh, first, a disclaimer. I am not a scientist. And so I have a little, thank you, I have a little anxiety. Uh, I have a little anxiety coming in today because I read through the listing of some of the past presentations and they're very technical. Um, and they frighten me a little bit because I'm the opposite of a scientist. Uh, my background is in human resources. Uh, as Beth said, in 2012, we added sustainable development to my role. Um, and I don't even claim to be an expert in sustainability, but I've learned a little bit along the way. And, and what I've learned about is that for us, sustainability has been an organizational development effort. That's why it made sense for someone in HR to get involved in it. So a little, uh, a little bit about the company and then I'll get into the story. Uh, Clark is a family-owned company. We're based out of St. Charles, Illinois. Uh, we're also a global company. We have locations throughout the United States and have a presence in Brazil, Mexico, India, uh, the United Arab em Emirates, and Australia. So we are a global company, family-owned, third-generation family-owned. We started in 1946. I joined the company in 2000, 2001. And a little bit of my backstory is this uh, this image is, is evocative of who we were in 2001. Um, this is a company that I did not want to go work for. In fact, that's part of the story. My story is, and when the company president and I talk about this, uh, when I joined the company, I came kicking and screaming a little bit. I really wanted to get out of where I was. But I joined the company with some reservation because it was a pesticide company. And I wasn't sure how I felt about it. And what I did know, though, was that it was a company that needed talent and needed someone like me to help it like, navigate through the growth that it was going through. But it was a pesticide company. I struggled with that. They didn't know how to talk to my friends. They didn't know how to talk to my colleagues about it. And in fact, when I would tell people I'd gone to work for Clark Mosquito Control, as we were, new, as we were known then, there was often this sound of crickets in the room because my colleagues and my friends and my peers had this hesitation in terms of the decision I had made to go work for a pesticide company. So I'm going to tell the story in, a, in, in various chapters. The first chapter is this recognition of pent-up desire. So this is who we were. And the story now is about 2008. We were the upside down dead mosquito company. We were focused on mosquito control. Uh, we were good at it, but we were very much focused on killing mosquitoes. And even that image, I think, is an image that says we're all about mosquito control and it's this orientation toward killing. 
we were old school. We were very conservative. We had big, heavy trucks. Uh, we were not. We were very manual in our processes. A lot of paper. A lot of inefficiencies. This is what we were known for. Now, some of you may rec recognize this type of truck, and this is certainly an old picture. But when I tell this story, when I when I show this slide, I often get a reaction. One of two reactions from people in the room. The first reaction is, oh yeah, I can remember when, I, when those trucks used to come to our neighborhood when I was a kid. My mom would gather us up, bring us into the house, close all the windows, and shut all the doors until the truck passed. The other reaction comes from the more courageous amongst the group, and that is we used to get on our bicycles. And we used to ride behind the trucks, and people are laughing because they've been there. We used to ride behind the trucks in the fog. And then there's this moment, this awkward moment, and this look, and the look is, am I gonna be okay? So again, recognizing that the industry has not always had a great reputation. We're doing good work in terms of addressing the issues of mosquito-borne disease, but an industry, pesticide industry, mosquito control industry did not have a great reputation. So again, this is where we were. We were, um, we were all that, and we were also pretty successful. We enjoyed significant market share. We were considered a trusted advisor in the industry, so we were doing well. So the question was, why change? In 2008, the company president, unbeknownst to us, uh, was struggling with this sense of um, a desire, this pent-up desire, this feeling in the gut of his stomach that said that there was more for him to do, this sense of greater purpose. He attributes it to five major factors. Uh, the first being, so he had taken over, so third generation, uh, he had taken over the leadership role from his father, and he was just exploring his own leadership style and his leadership identity. And he was going to various leadership uh, retreats and workshops, and one of them, like most of these workshops, there was a lot of posting of uh, post-its and, and notes on the board, and at the end of the workshop, they, all participants were invited to take home any of the images as an icon, as a, as a souvenir of their experience, the ones that resonated with them. And this was the note that he took. Somebody else had written it, but the sense of if you don't do something different, you're going to wind up exactly where you're headed. That struck him. This sense of from the time he was a little boy and his grandmother said, John Lyle, you're going to work for that upside down dead mosquito. He said, I struggled with that. So he carries this note in his pocket, to, or in his wallet today. The second is this recognition that he can make a difference. Now, I love this picture because it gives you a sense of the president of fun. So he's a real guy. He's a good guy. He's a PhD in, he has a PhD in entomology. So he's a very smart, very bright guy. He's also somebody that's um, open to having me post a picture of him in a kiddie pool. Uh, but, the, but the point of this story is he and his wife um, had had three biological children who had all left the house, all launched successfully, and just as we're, they're coping with being empty nesters, they decide that they're going to adopt a baby boy from Russia. Uh, they go to Russia, they um, adopt Joe. And Joe, at the time they adopted, is about 18 months old. He's small, he's been living in an orphanage, in this tiny little orphanage. In a, in his life, up until that point, had had very little stimulation. There wasn't any growth charts. They brought him home, and Joe, Surrounded by the love and the family, he began to thrive and immediately became this just amazing kid that was struck by everything. Everything in the world was exciting, and he's a bright kid, and, it, and he's very courageous. And it was Lyle's realization that he had the power as one person in the world to make a difference in the lives of others. We also had a product from a business perspective that was coming through our product development pipeline that was new and unique and ultimately would go on to become the industry's first OMRI certified product, certified for use in and around organic farms. This is a larvicide product derived from natural ingredients called Natural So we knew that, we had some, that something exciting was happening in our business and we were struggling with whether we were prepared to change fast enough for the change that this product represented. Lyle was also working on his own education. He was being exposed to a lot of the great thought leaders of sustainability. Some of these names you'll recognize. Uh, ones that I think were particularly important to Lyle was Ray, Ray Anderson's course correction. This recognition that a person in an industry that it, with a bad reputation could in fact make a mid-course correction and change the, the future 
of the company and change the future of the industry. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ray Anderson, former owner, now deceased of Interface Carpeting. Uh, we were reading, uh, he was reading uh, Chris Lazlo's Sustainable Value, um, Cradle to Cradle, Willie McDonough, and Michael, Brom Michael Bromgart. Um, and we were also being exposed to Andrew Winston's Green Recovery. Andrew had written Green to Gold, but during the recession, he wrote Green Recovery and basically was saying, which uh, was a uh, heretical thought to some degree, was that companies who were abandoning sustainability during the time of the recession, um, he was recognizing the companies who were abandoning sustainability. And he was saying it's the companies that stay the course, that continue to focus on sustainability, that will come out of the recession healthier, stronger, more capable than others. And that became something that we followed. And then there was a sense of the next generation. Now, from an organizational point of view, this is probably the one that influenced me most. So this is a picture of John Clark IV. And uh, around this time, John, or Johnny, went to work for New Belgium Brewing. You know New Belgium, got some knots in the room. So there's this thing about craft breweries, right? Craft breweries, I'm a big fan of beer. I love craft beer. But what I recognize about craft breweries is that a lot of them, especially the craft ones, they come from this place of cruelness, right? They come from this place of innovation, this place of inspiration. So Johnny goes to work for New Belgium and they're a cool company and they've got cool policies. They've got great recycling programs and zero waste programs. They've got these great policies where employees get um, incentives to buy hybrids and more fuel efficient vehicles. And John's calling up his dad and saying, hey dad, this is what's going on in New Belgium. And so suddenly there's this shift where Lyle, who has been pretty, pretty traditional in his way of managing the company, is being influenced by the next generation. Craft, craft breweries are born cool. We weren't. We had to find our way to cool. So summer of 2008, um, we have an annual planning meeting. It happens every year, and it's our strategic planning. We're all getting ready to head out of town. We get this memo from the company presidents. Um, from the president's assistant saying that we've got it, if we haven't left yet, stop, go back, get your bathing suit, get a flip flop, get your flip flops. Now, I'm the only woman on the team at that point, and I'm not exactly sure that I'm comfortable with bringing my bathing suit to a strategic retreat, but we do it. So we get to this retreat, and Lau sits us down. And he starts to talk to us. He starts to talk about how excited he is about this new product that's coming out. And he starts to talk about how frustrated he is by our industry, the slow pace of change, our inability to face our detractors and have honest conversations with ourselves. And then he starts to talk about his own growing sense of responsibility for the environment. Now, not to suggest that we weren't doing it well before, but he wanted to elevate our sense of responsibility. And he asked us in a very poignant manner, he said, I want you to take a leap of faith with me. He told us a story about Joe, story about Joe, the, the adopted boy from Russia. He, he told a story about taking Joe to the public pool. And they, they, they're walking along the side of the pool and Joe breaks free from dad's hand and he runs down to the deep end and he jumps in. And Lyle says his heart stopped because he didn't know what to do. He didn't know whether he should jump in the pool and, and try and get him and he waited. And it felt like, like forever. And then suddenly Joe broke through the surface with this look on his face. This energy, this amazement of, Dad, that was great. What's next? And Lyle started to cry as he told this story. He said, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what's gonna, where it's going to take us. It's something, it's something about sustainability. It's something about the environment. It's something green. But I want to invite you to take a leap of faith with me and to figure this out. And he kept using this gesture. He'd say, it's, it's green, but it's bigger. It's bigger than just green. So then we all went down to the pool at the resort and we quite literally took that leap of faith with him. So that started the process in 2008. And we did this mood boarding exercise. Really interesting experience. We were invited by our consultants to look at uh, images in magazines, the images that represented who we were today. If we were a car, what would we be? If we were an animal, what would we be? So this is what we were. 
<laughs> we, we were Bruce Willis. We were Rambo. Uh, I think we were also Ronald Reagan. Um, I remember that one. We were big, heavy-duty trucks, and we were black bears. Okay, so we were dependable, we were sturdy, we were strong. We were a little hyper macho, just a little bit. All right, so then we took a break, and then we were invited to do the same exercise. And in this exercise, though, we were asked to find images that represented who we were if we were, if we were to become the best version of ourselves. And it's a little corny, but we worked with what we had. Uh, we were Kermit the Frog. We were nature. We were birds. We were thinking green. We were sustainable. And in one really dramatic moment, one of the teams said, we're salmon. We're going to swim upstream, and we're going to we're prepared to sacrifice sacrifice ourselves to protect the next generation. And in that moment, Lyle realized that what he was struggling with, the sense of pent up desire, and I realized what I was struggling with was something that was shared by the team members. And so we got started, and so we began to explore uh, the ideas of sustainability, and we did, and we learned about the six values of business value, the six levels of business value creation uh, presented by Chris Laszlo in his book, Sustainable Value, basically saying that the sustainability is more than just about the environment to make it a business, um, a viable business um, approach is to understand that there is value in this, that the companies that focus on sustainability that really embed sustainability into their entire organization have a greater chance of being more successful, more profitable, um, in their business. And then we began to just chart a roadmap and we talked about all of the aspects of sustainability in terms of how it was going to influence us and what it would look like over the next few years. So we began to vision what the future would look like. We went from being the upside down dead mosquito company, your trusted partner in mosquito control, to shifting our brand to a mission of making communities around the world more safe, mobile, safe, and comfortable. So shifting from a focus on killing to a focus on public health, making communities more livable, safe, and comfortable. And we went from our image of the upside down dead mosquito to an image that became more iconic as a shield. This is one of the hardest things that we did, changing that image. But that image stood for innovation and, and really dedicating our efforts and our resources to bring new and innovative products into the market to seek out the next honorary certified products. It was about community and connecting with the community, and it was about sustainability and really taking stock of our environmental impact and how we were affecting the environment in all aspects of our business. And yet, we're still in the mosquito control industry, and we had to recognize that we had products in our portfolio that were less um, green than others. We had traditional chemistries, traditional products, and we still do. What we did though is we created a way to look at them and so we got conventional products. We have some products that we've already have begun to move along this eco cure index, if you will. And our focus in terms of where our, our resource dollars are going, our resources are going in terms of product development, go to bring next generation products into the market. Uh, bring our chemistries, uh, electric powered, people powered, if you will. I'll tell you a story about that. So that's where all of our resource dollars are going. And it's taken us a long time. I was, I was explaining to Kevin about this, that this was ambitious when we created this, this Eco-Tier Index. It took a long time for it to truly get traction. Today, as of today and in the last year, we have a very clear product development roadmap. And one of the first criteria is a very robust screening around environmental impacts using some of the concepts of green chemistry. So the reality has changed didn't happen overnight. In fact, uh, a couple of things that were really interesting back in 2008 is our industry was not open to this change at all. We were a very traditional industry. Our customers uh, were suspect of it. They made fun of us. They were they were doing all sorts of things. So we so we soft we did some soft launches. We didn't make a big stink about this. We didn't we didn't introduce ourselves as the new. BP, uh, we were, um, you know, we introduced, we introduced it very softly. And in fact, it was a couple of years before we even began to talk about sustainability in the way we do today. 
uh, one of the interesting stories, we did a uh, packaging um, survey. We were really interested in understanding how we could improve our return recyclable packaging program. So we did a survey and we sent it out to most of our customers. And I remember reading the anecdotal comments and there was one of them that was really meaningful. And this is about 2010. Um, the, the customer had said, I am really tired of hearing about this sustainability stuff. And in fact, Clark, if you continue this, we're done with you. So it took a lot of courage to stay the course. We had people in our organization leave because they didn't want to be troubled with this. They weren't passionate about it. They thought we were all drinking some crazy Kool-Aid. So what we found uh, was that we really needed to have some real courage around this. Back in 2008, this was cutting edge stuff and we were swimming upstream. We needed that courage, we needed to be committed to it, senior leadership had to be involved in it, we had to be willing to question ourselves and have tough questions and conversations about the types of products that we had in our portfolio and where our product development efforts were going. And we had to figure out a way to make it stick. So first thing, one of the first things we did, we, which, which is kind of the crux of the story, is all of the efforts and all the progress that we've made, we've made because we figured out a way to engage everyone. And that was one of the first things that we did. We brought all of our employees together for the first time from all over the world for a full day meeting. We had speakers come and talk about sustainability, and we did some brainstorming. And in fact, out of that one day, we came up with 875 ideas, some of them really simple and very self-serving. We were going to adopt a um, casual dress, co dress code because of the issues associated with dry cleaning. Um, that made a lot of sense. Uh, but some of them were more provocative and more, were more interesting in terms of how might we convert our fleet to more environmentally friendly, less impact vehicles. So in those first few years then, following that meeting, we established our first set of sustainability goals. And if I'm totally honest, we didn't know necessarily um, where we were, we didn't have benchmarks at this point, but we knew that these were the common goals. We'd done some research. We knew that we needed a goal around carbon, around waste, around energy, and we also wanted to have um, a, um, a motivation around how we would design our future facilities. We wanted to connect to the communities in terms of a willingness to donate the value of one full-time person every year to our communities and to begin to explore the concepts of cradle to cradle in our pack packaging efforts. We created a first set of sustainability teams and that was uh, inspired by the president. He did a reach out, he said, I'm looking for people who are interested. And we got a group of people together and we started to make progress. And we made progress around uh, reducing paper in our processes and automating things and, and our initial zero waste, pro waste programs and in our, in our fleet, making some, some changes in how we brought with our fleet. But one of the things that we found after about a year was that we had Lyle, who was the company president, and we had this passionate team of employees. And this passionate team of employees were often the youngest, and um, in terms of organizational structure, uh, the lowest level. So that our first level employees, our first level supervisors. And, and my visual is I got one hand above my head and one hand uh, about my midsection, because I think this is important to recognize what this means. We've got all of the space between the president and, and all of these employees, and that space is filled with our managers, our middle managers and our most senior managers, that are telling these same employees, okay, that's really great that you're working on these special projects, but it's time for you to get back to work. So we were at risk of losing momentum if we didn't figure out a way to embed it into the organization. And that's one of the things that Chris Lazo taught us was that if it's a bolt-on, you're only gonna get so far. But if you embed it in your organization, you can make change happen in everything that, you, everything that we do. So we did some research, we talked to a number of different companies, and we came up with what we call Project Greater Purpose. This is an organizational structure. We said we created a sustainability advisory board made up of our most senior leaders and our key project leaders. We created five committees that gave us this, this depth, this array of opportunities that when Lyle said it's about green, but it's so much greater, we took the greatest view of it. We said, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna focus on everything from communication to uh, community and philanthropy in terms of our social responsibility. 
good earth, what we can teach our employees about what they can do in their own lives outside of work, uh, health, wellness, and safety, and, and of course, a single business. And this is just a, a slide with some of our first major initiatives. One of the first things we needed to do was learn about carbon footprint and, and uh, establish our carbon footprint and then begin to track and report on it. Uh, we, we held Earth Day events and special recycling drives in the organization. We still do that. Uh, we started our volunteer policies, speakers programs, and just this array of activities. And again, some people, Mike has said, well, what does, um, what does healthcare benchmarking have to do with sustainability? And we said everything that has to do with the good of our people, the, the health and wellness of our people is also about our sustainability program because it's, it's about the environment, but it's about sustaining the organization in a responsible way. So again, we created these opportunities, gave everybody a chance to get involved where they wanted to get involved. Because in fact, in the early days of this, we found if we focused on it as the environment, as an environmental issue, or if we focused our discussion on climate change, we'd enter, end up in these debates. And so we stopped doing that. And we said, here's some things to get involved in, and here's why we think it's important. So we got our leaders involved, we got our employees involved, we built it into, into our job descriptions and our bonus programs. In fact, every employee is expected to be involved in some way the sustainability related initiatives as part of their bonus program and part of their job description. And 78%, close to 80% of our employees are actively involved in some form or fashion in an initiative, a project, a team that supports our sustainability efforts. <coughs> I've shared, uh, I've already shared a lot of this. I think really the key point in here is that uh, one of the most findings for the company president was that to some degree he was in the way because he was attempting to run it all. We got him out of the way, the employees began to run it, and then we sought leadership and guidance from the executive team. It became this very bottom-up, middle-managed uh, organizational chain effort that was supported and guided by the highest level of leaders. <coughs> So um, by 2011, 2012, we made really great progress. Uh, I think we had started to submit for the uh, Governor's Sustainability Award, so we were feeling pretty good about it. But there was also the sense that we weren't quite there, that there was more that we could do, that we needed to accelerate our efforts. So we got involved in a change effort, uh, which, is, which is interesting and exciting, and is perhaps one of the most important things that we do at Clark. So I want to share just a little bit about it how we create a change at the scale of the entire organization in a very fast way. There's a program out there, a change methodology program called Appreciative Inquiry. If you haven't heard of this, it's a really interesting approach. In most change management programs, you focus on root cause analysis, you focus on you do your SWOTs, and so there's this, this focus on uh, what's missing or where you're stressed, you're focused on, focus on deficits, Appreciative inquiry turns that upside down. And it says basically, leverage the strengths of your organization to the, which is a Peter Drucker quote, to the extent that you make the weaknesses of your organization irrelevant. So our first appreciative inquiry event, where we brought all of our employees together, was held in 2012. And for three days, starting with the first day, where we focused on identifying our strengths figuring out when we were at our best, what were we, what were our characteristics, what were we capable of doing, and then from that place of strength, creating a vision for the future, in terms of looking five years into the future and saying, we've woken up from this amazing dream, and we are our best selves. What do we look like, what are we doing? And then we spend the next two days exploring the opportunities that that vision creates for us and beginning to prototype real initiatives that we could deploy. So in 2012, Clark Plus, 2012, came together. We had close to 150 people there, all of our employees, plus about 20 external stakeholders, customers, suppliers, partners, thought leaders, members of the community. And we spent three days. Um, this picture, uh, this picture of Lyle in the upper left-hand corner, uh, our company president. And I just saw that picture in the lower right-hand corner, because basically what it's telling me 
is that if you give pipe cleaners and balloons to people in the mosquito control industry, they're going to make mosquitoes. So we came out of that. We came out of that three-day event with like five different 3D images of mosquitoes making pipe cleaners and balloons. And we came out with ten areas of opportunity. So I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to hit some highlights on four of them: our zero waste efforts, our transformational energy solutions, how Clark cares, and the Clark campus in the future. Just examples of some of the work that we've done. So at, our, at this event, we've been working on waste management, and somebody said, well, that's not good enough. Let's get to zero waste. We didn't know what zero waste meant, but we thought, well, let's elevate it. Let's figure out how we can get better at this. And so we began to elevate the work that we'd already started. And some of that included um, the work to make paper from our processes, a streamline things. Uh, we make uh, process improvements. We uh, developed returnable, refillable packaging programs, both to the market in terms of our customers, but also for our intercompany transactions. Uh, we created waste champions for every location. Uh, we created waste stations and redesigns, uh, redesigned our facilities to have a waste strategy. We did dumpster dives, employee training. And we even met with our vendors and our suppliers, especially the people who cleaned our facilities, and we walked them through our program so that they could support our efforts. And then I think it was 2011, we adopted a, uh, or actually 2013, we adopted a zero waste energy, um, sorry, a waste to energy program. And in parentheses, I said less bad. And we recognize that. And if you um, have done any, um, if, if, you've, if you're involved with the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council or have done any research on zero waste, uh, we have to acknowledge that this is not the best solution. It's a better solution than landfill, certainly, but sending our non-recyclable waste to a zero uh, to a waste to energy facility where it is incinerated in a closed loop system, converted to energy, is less bad than landfill, but it is not the perfect solution. So we recognize, and I just want to own, own that, we recognize that our best strategy will be to reduce our waste. That said, in those years in our focus on zero waste, we went from having 245 tons of waste going to landfill to just four tons. We cut our waste stream by 64%. This was by 2014. And more than 80% of our waste is being recycled by focusing on waste. So we made real progress. We're not zero waste yet. We're still working on that. We've had some challenges in the last year. We've, we've, um, in terms of our numbers, not getting to that 90% that's required by the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council, uh, but we're still focused to that goal. Our transformational energy solutions, focusing on carbon footprints and our re reducing our reliance on fossil fuels and our energy efficiency. Um, so some of the things we did, and, and a lot of these you know. We, we worked in our facility, we changed lighting out, uh, we, our fleet, uh, we made changes in our fleet. Uh, most of our carbon, when we began to track it, we realized it comes from our fleet. And so we had these big heavy duty trucks, so we converted our trucks to hybrids wherever possible. Uh, we adopted the green power contracts here in Illinois, um, which have been great, uh, not necessarily a literal um, reduction program, but some, something that um, supports the industry and, and, we, and allows us to receive renewable, renewable energy credits. And then we've adopted on-site solar. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. One of the really fun stories is in our business in terms of the fleet and where we went from using vehicles to do a very large part of our ground operation to moving to bicycles. So mosquito control in uh, urban areas, most of the mosquitoes are actually um, breeding in the storm sewers, in the catch basin of the storm sewers, where, which holds water. And so typically and traditionally in mosquito control, um, that is managed by a person who is driving a truck, and often it's equipped with a right-hand drive, driving a truck every fifth, and stopping every 15 feet to drop a pellet of product or a dose of granular product into the storm sewer. So drive 15 feet, drive 15 feet, drive 15 feet. Um, incredibly inefficient process, uh, heavy reliance on vehicles and, car and, uh, and fossil fuel, and, and just mind-numbing 
in its border. Just, just a really tough curve. So what we did was we uh, converted 80% of that operation. In some areas we can't do it, it's not safe, but we converted 80% of that operation to bicycle. So now we have a Prius with four bikes on the back. The crew gets on the Prius in the morning, they go out into the community, they get, they get to a central location, they take their bikes off, they go out and they spend their day on the bike. And that crew that ended up being impossible to hire because it was so mind-numbing in its boredom, now, now has a waiting list because everybody wants to work on a bike group. They get to wear shorts. And it's a cool job for, for college students. And our operation is more efficient than it ever has been. So we've reduced costs in terms of vehicles, we reduced our carbon footprint, we uh, made it easier to hire, and it's a much more efficient operation. By 2014, we had hit that goal of reducing our carbon footprint by 25%. More importantly, we saved close to $700,000 in our operational expenses by taking fleet, uh, large trucks out of our fleet, by routing our fleet more effectively, um, by making sense of our business, um, by doing things the right way. Now, in any sustainability effort, when they talk about the triple bottom line, they talk about the community in terms of giving back to the community. And so we have an organization um, or an effort called House Heart Cares. We care both globally and locally, and we've adopted a program, um, volunteer policies. We also have an annual day of caring where all of our locations throughout the world, uh, all of our employees spend the day out in the environment doing environmental projects. I was in Texas this year. We do a lot of work here in Illinois, DuPage, and Kane County. And when we started the program, we, um, we held this event in September. In September because it was at the end of our season and it was convenient. We moved it to July, the middle of our season, terribly inconvenient for a couple of reasons. Um, well, actually for one big reason. And that was because we hire about 300 kids, seasonal workers. And if we hold it in July, we have the greatest impact on our community and we allow everyone in the organization to have this experience. It's a great day, it's amazing. And in one day, we donate close to the value of one full-time person to our communities. We established the Clark Harris Foundation. We have a partnership with the, with the Carter Foundation. And through the Clark Harris Foundation, we raise funds to bring insecticidal and impregnated bed nets to areas in Nigeria that are struggling with malaria and lymphatic filariasis. Let's go back to that for one minute. Uh, so for every $10, for every bed net that we spend, that we send, uh, a bed net can protect on average about three people. So over the course of the last number of years, or actually on an annual basis, we are sending enough bed nets to Nigeria to save the, or protect the lives of close to 100,000 people. We received a letter from the Carter Foundation a couple of years ago, two years ago, that was sent to us and a number of other key partners saying that through our efforts, we had effectively eradicated lymphatic filariasis, also known as elephantiasis, mm -hmm. that we had effectively eradicated it from one of the villages in Nigeria. So for us, this is an example of how a mid-sized company, we're not that big, we have about 170 full-time employees, can make a real difference in the world just by something. And then um, at, at our Clark Plus event, one of the employees uh, stood up and had this, made this comment. And so I, she said, you know, I know we're doing all this with the Clark Cares Foundation. I know we're doing all this with our volunteer efforts, but what about the company putting something up? And so we started exploring how we might make a commitment of our revenues to the environment. Uh, you've heard 1% uh, for the planet. So we had, we've been in conversations with 1% for the planet. Uh, we thought we were going to join that organization. We ultimately got turned down by them, I think in part because we were not big enough, and in part because we're in the pesticide industry, and they weren't sure how they felt about that, lying with us. Now, just as a side note, i got to tell you that isn't it the companies that are in those industries that need to be doing this work? The industries that, that do have challenges, whether it's the carpeting industry or a pesticide company, um, it never made sense to us that, that they, that they um, turned us down. It also never made sense to us to not try. So we created our own program, One for Tomorrow, 
where we have 1% of our revenues from our next generation, our most, our Armory certified and our greenest and most uh, eco-responsible products and services, 1% of those revenues are given back to the community. So just a couple of weeks ago, we, um, the Friends of the Forest Preserves in DuPage County, we gave them a check for $23,000. We, we give out funds in seven regions of the world, one, one for tomorrow. Then at this, this event, there was this, um, there was this moment where the employees got up and they envisioned a facility, this facility that they called the Clark Campus of the Future. And, and they designed it in their heads. They had it, they had it designed. It was this, this facility that would become this physical manifestation of our mission, vision, and values that would, um, foster greater collaboration and greater innovation and connect our science and our business to the community and, to, and our employees to nature. Uh, they called it the Clark Campus of the Future. We weren't looking for a facility. In 2012, we found a facility. In 2014, we took occupancy of it. This is our facility in St. Charles in Illinois. This was one of the most exciting things that we had done. And you talk about giving a bolt, a, a shot of energy to an organization, give them a facility where sunlight is streaming in all day. Give them a facility where you're restoring the land through a prairie restoration project, where you've got on-site gardens and employees can go out and get their lunch right out of the garden. This facility is amazing. We've got over 300 solar panels on the roof of this facility. And then we have solar panels on the roof of the car charging station and, and uh, a light shelf, and we are um, producing approximately 24% of our electricity needs for this facility through on-site solar. That represents about 12% of our total electricity needs for the company. So we did some really cool stuff. We did some really cool stuff by getting everybody involved and really leveraging our strengths, engaging the entire organization. And then in 2016, we said, well, you know, we're not done. We want, to, we want to take it to the next level. We like this appreciative fiery stuff. It gives us this motivation. It gives us stuff to work with. And we've also been to explore this concept. I don't know if you've, you've thought about this or if this is part of what is part of the conversation, and that is, is sustainability good enough? So those same thought leaders that we were exposed to began talking to us about uh, this concern, and, and we've heard this. That we're not going to get to where we need to get to simply by conserving. We're not gonna to get to where we need to get to simply by reducing. We need to figure out a way to regenerate. We can regenerate certainly by restoring our prairie, um, but it becomes this concept of sustainability isn't enough. It needs to be bigger than being simply sustainable. And so this emerging concept of a flourishing enterprise began to get our attention. And this idea that we could create an organization where our business prospers, our employees thrive, and nature flourishes. So in 2016, we brought the group back together for another three days, and this time we had close to 200 people there, all of our employees, key partners, key members of the community. We had 12 students from a local high school there. That was really interesting. To hear the voice of the next generation telling us what the next generation of employees wanted in their future career. And it was it was environments of um, collaboration and technology and inclusiveness and diversity, and, and they influenced our policies just by their presence at this event. And you can see the, how our language begins to shift from accelerating sustainability to creating something better. Sustainability is a foundation for it. We haven't abandoned that, but it's now, once you get past a certain level, you've got to think bigger. And this question has become part of our language. I love this question. This question, how might we? So instead of figuring out what's wrong, who started it, what's, what's the root cause, how could we? This, this phrase of how might we have curiosity, might, possibility, we, inclusivity. How might we create a culture before engagement within our organization? How might we foster the movement of social generosity, both within our organization and outside of our organization, really inspire people to give back? How might we become a voice for our industry so that 
what we feel that we've elevated in terms of our own sense and, and responsibility for the pesticide industry, we can bring out to the industry and then allow, help the industry improve its reputation. And how might we become the agent of world health benefit? This is that a really dramatic shift from where we were once upon a time when we were all about killing mosquitoes. This is the focus on, about saving lives. And coming out of that event in February of 2017, actually at that event we had a we had a guy there, a partner from an organization called Guatemala, uh, a equipment company from Brazil. So February 2017 or 2016, and we're starting to hear stories about this mosquito-borne disease that um, was new that we hadn't seen before. And we started to hear stories about babies being affected with microencephaly. And this gentleman from Brazil he stood up at this event and he said, and he, he appealed to us. He said, when you think about your future and you think about this vision, think about how you can help communities with this because children families, next generation is being affected. We came out of that event, we weren't sure what was going to happen, and in the summer of 2016, uh, the Zika virus showed up in the United States, first from travel cases, and then in Miami-Dade it showed up through local transmission. We became the partner to Miami-Dade County. We deployed in eight weeks more than, more than 100 people, Boots are on the ground, going door to door, doing education within the community in three languages, doing surveillance work, looking for the mosquitoes that were the vectors for disease, and doing control work. By November, we received notice that we had effectively stopped the transmission, the local transmission of the Zika virus. And we did that inspired by the sense of how might we become an agent of world, of world health benefit. And there were some great ideas. In fact, the upper right hand corner is a picture of a mobile command center. This was the craziest idea that came out of Clark Plus 2016. And that was this vehicle that we could send across the country that would be this flagship vehicle. And it was it was crazy because they're expensive and it was just it was just crazy. And in the summer of 2016, this ended up becoming part of a bid spec with Miami Day, with actually with the Florida Department of Health. And by August of 2016, we had a 52 foot trailer that we had purchased equipped with the best mosquito surveillance equipment, wrapped it, and sent it to Florida. It is now in Brownsville, Texas, where we are currently working on the Zika control program. And the last story I want to tell you is a story about the flourishing garden. So we talked about facilities, and our facilities have not been certified as lead. They're designed to lead standards. So the campus, the renovation of our campus was designed to meet standards. Uh, this facility, the Flourishing Garden, today uh, and since 1976, our ground operations, our largest ground operations, are run out of a facility in Roselle, Illinois, an old farmhouse, which sounds really cute, but it's not. Uh, in fact, <laughs> there are some things that shouldn't be preserved. This farmhouse will not be preserved. Mm -hmm. um, starting a couple of years ago, we brought the employees together for a design charrette, and we designed a new facility. We call it the Flourishing Garden because it's on Garden Avenue. We call it Flourishing for all these reasons. We designed a facility. We're going to take occupancy next month. It is, it is designed to become a regenerative building, a building where we expect and project to produce more energy than, we'll, than we will consume over the course of the year. And we believe that this will be the first commercial facility of its type in the state of Illinois, with geothermal wells, on-site solar, orientation to the sun, um, rain gardens, rain recover water recovery programs, a whole restoration. That's a facility that for the employees that live in that building, that will be the bolt of energy, the infusion of, of innovation that will change their lives. So that's who we work. I look back at this and I remember how difficult it was to abandon this this icon, because we love this. Um, but I look back at it now, and it's, I don't know, maybe it's like looking at your picture when you were in high school, <laughs> right? <laughs> About some fashion that you thought was really cool, but turns out it was a stand the test of time. I don't think this stands the test of time. This is who we are today. So through, sustain, through focusing on sustainability, not just green, but something bigger, we've transformed our entire organization. We're having more fun. Uh, we're more colorful, we're more vibrant, we're more innovative than we ever were. 
we've cut costs, we've taken expenses out of the business. We came out of the recession, the recession much healthier than we ever imagined we could have been, and that has continued for us. Our costs are down, turnover is down. We have about 6% uh, turnover annually right now. Um, we'd like to get it at less than 5%, uh, so that's our goal today. We do have a new set of goals. I did not cover them today. They're on our website. Uh, we know that we've reduced our environmental impact, and we continue to do that. More importantly, we have a culture that we're proud of, and it makes sense, and it invites great talent to the organization. We've brought people into our product development efforts that are inspired to bring new and innovative and green chemistry, using, using the principles of green chemistry to bring new, innovative, next generation, softer chemistry products into our industry. The future Armory certified products. products. We're engaging with our customers in ways that we never imagined. So from 2008, when customers didn't want to talk about this, now this is all we talk about. And customers come and visit us. They want to see our facilities, and they're inspired by us. We're having different types of conversations with our suppliers. Big companies that once never paid, once didn't pay a whole lot of attention to us are now paying attention to us, and we're having much more engaged conversations. We have a greater sense of who we are, and innovation is coming from everywhere in the organization. In terms of just some key takeaways, and I apologize, I think we're running out of time. Um, purpose gave us a focus. It wasn't just about sustainability. It was something bigger, and, and it came from somewhere genuine. Um, we made a commitment to it. We engaged, engaged all of our employees. We still do. Uh, we created a structure to help embed it into the organization, and it's a journey. It's a journey that we continue on. We'll come together again in 2020. We'll look at how we're doing on our goals, and we'll set a new set. Of, we'll create a new set of opportunity areas that we'll explore. In 2017, in January, I celebrated my 17th anniversary. Um, I told you this was a company that I didn't want to go work for, a company I didn't know how to talk about. Um, I know how to talk about it now, and it's real, and it's genuine, and I'm having the most fun I've ever had in my career, doing some great work with some great people inspired by sustainability and we're not experts experts i won't claim this so I, I won't claim that we have it all figured out in fact we don't um and i won't claim that this is the only way to do it this is what worked for us and so our hope in sharing the story is that perhaps we'll share a story that resonates or that will inspire in some way uh, about how you can make real transformation through adopting the mindset of sustainability and engaging your entire organization. Thank you. Thank you for the very inspiring presentation. Um, we do have time for a few questions if the audience would like to have. Julia, Not a science question, okay? No, <laughs> Julia was very inspiring and what a great story. And now the question I have for you is, um, you, you've done a lot, it looks like, and I'm trying to remember the definition, I think it's kind of a stage one and stage two. Um, what have you done on the supply chain end of things in order to drive sustainability through the supply chain? Um, you know, I think um, I, would, I would like to say that we have been able to have a direct influence by um, establishing policy in terms of what we will and, and won't um, and, and be able to call out suppliers by, by um, applying that. Um, that's been a challenge because we're in a very niche market in a very niche industry and so we don't have a lot of uh, potential partners to choose from. Um, so the, the um, perhaps the less impressive answer is that um, I think it's that we change the conversations with our suppliers. And we know we're influencing their policy without mandating that they have to do things our way uh, because we didn't feel like we had that leverage. Um, instead, what has happened is that we are partnering up with them differently. In fact, there's a company that we work with, um, th there's two, with a customer, um, we've met with them and shared our story. That inspired them. They invited us up last winter to share their stories and all the things that they've done in their business because of what we've done. And so we're influencing without mandating. 
Um, there's another customer that's coming in in October that wants to sit down and talk with us because they want to figure out a way to um, create an organization that's more focused on sustainability. And just a comment, that is a very important point there that you said you're influencing without mandating because I, I've been involved in a number of situations. I'll give you just a picture of just the opposite where I'm going to say a large multinational came into a small $20 million supplier and said, thou shalt institute sustainability tomorrow. Here's a large PowerPoint deck. You will report to us monthly. Uh, and oh, by the way, of course, we're not going to give you any break on your transfer price as a result of that. And that didn't go over very well. So it's very interesting. That's a great story that. You know, Kevin, thanks for asking that question because I think as I was answering it, I was a little um, embarrassed. And, and in, that, in this moment, I think I've realized that, that we, we didn't mandate sustainability within our organization either. That wasn't going to work. And so for us, um, we find it easier to get people to come along by inviting them into the conversation. And, and, and so we don't have that leverage. But the other thing is that, and I suspect those big companies that come in and they impose that, the, the companies that they're working with, um, they're, adopt, they're bolting it on. Um, it may not go that, that deep. It may not get embedded because it becomes something that you have to do versus something you're inspired to do. You stay. Yeah, I stay. Thank you, you stay. I asked you to get to the good stuff in the first 30 <laughs> minutes. I kept getting better. So I kept staying. It keeps All getting right. better. All right, great. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, so the, the other side is the customer side. Yeah. You, you mentioned it a couple of times that you've got a wider range of eco certified products. Back in 2008, most of your customers didn't want to talk about doing it. Uh, what are you doing to kind of uh, engage with customers to you know, not only spread the word about being sustainable in their own operations, but using more sustainable approaches to cost management. I guess some of your customers are municipalities, mm -hmm. and you know, there are some leading municipalities that are you know, looking right. at you know, a less right. toxic approach. Are you communicating with them about we we, we do so it would be a similar uh, response to the response with um, to Kevin's question regarding suppliers. It's been a relatively soft approach uh, that has built has been building momentum. Uh, momentum for a couple of reasons. Um, we recognize that this industry that in 2008 was pretty old school. That it also has people in it that are retiring, and so we have a new group of leaders emerging. Uh, we also have communities that are changing and wanting more of this. So there's a bit of a combination. There are some people in our, um, there are some customers that we have that want that don't care. They're gonna buy the cheapest product, they're gonna buy the product they're, they're most comfortable with, and that may not be the softest product. We also have a lot of customers that are coming along. In fact, in Illinois, we've adopted a program called Earthright. This is our organic service program where we use our softest chemistries, we use natural art, we use electric vehicles, we use electric equipment, and that has caught on in the Northwest uh, Chicago area. Uh, communities who really are interested in having the most eco-friendly service in their community. So we're seeing, we're seeing um, more adoption. The truth is when we did a materiality survey, survey in 2015, at least 2015. Uh, one of the things we heard from our customers is that if we were to rank all of the material, um, the the material issues, um, the environment for them was was up there, but it was was on the lower end of it. What was more important to them was um, innovative products that work, that address pe pesticide resistance issues, and reduce the risk of disease. And so, for some customers, that comes with a story about sustainability. For some customers, we, we don't push the story because it may turn them off. Um, so it's kind of a combination of things. Uh, I am seeing, we are seeing though this migration and this movement where um, we recognize that the people who are on board, is, that the group is getting bigger and, and the industry is beginning to change. Um, perhaps the greatest indication of that, uh, two things. In, I'm gonna, I, I don't know what the year is, but we, we um, I think it was 2012, 
2013, we co-hosted the industry's first symposium on sustainability. So that was a major movement. Um, and the other is um, that our competitors have begun to mirror some of the things that we're doing. So that certainly is a great. And advantage. what's happened to the market structure over the last decade? You know, like, are there more niche players that only do kind of eco-friendly pesticide control, or are there you know integrated, um, diversified companies like yours? Well, the first is uh, mosquito control. Our business in mosquito control, um, not so much on aquatic habitat management, but mosquito control is a very niche industry, and there are very few small companies like us that do everything. Historically, were really big companies where there was a mosquito or vector vector borne disease arm to the company. Um, we've seen less. The big players have gotten out a little bit, so there aren't a lot of players in this industry. There's a small handful um, of folks. Uh, certainly, Dow AgroScience, um, Bayer, um, Adapco, uh, but they're not. There's there's not a lot of players. And so if we are having an influence, we're having an influence in a small pool. And, and that's a good thing. Uh, but it took a, it, it took a lot of um, courage because there was this sense that uh, we were going to lose customers. And, and I suspect we did. And, and now the industry itself has been changed. And the, and the environment has changed. And the communities are asking for more eco-responsible products. Other questions? Um, I'll ask one. Okay. <laughs> uh, what advice can you give to organizations or businesses that are currently in Clark's position as they were in 2008? You know, I think um, I think to me the magic why it, why it worked so well for us and continues to work so well for us is it goes back to the very beginning, and that is we didn't just adopt a program, we didn't just hire in a sustainability expert. In fact. None of us are, we don't have one expert. We have a lot of small experts. Um, we got everybody involved. And it came from a place of genuine commitment to change, to change it. I've met with a number of organizations over the years and I can tell which ones are right to change because they have that. And I can tell which ones are gonna struggle because often it's, I'm not meeting with the top folks. I'm meeting with somebody that they've hired who's trying to make change happen and that's, uh, boy, that's a tough, that's a tough go. So um, I think it's to try and um, change happens, especially small organizations. It's all about the top person being committed to it and then engaging the entire organization in a real authentic way. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.